Welcome to the 1972 Nobel Prize in Physics. This is a special one because this year I was born, so I kind of like this prize. Didn't go to me, but still, maybe it should have just for being born. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so this prize went to uh, jointly to three people, John Bardeen, Leon Cooper, and uh, John Schreifer. Now, if one of those names sounds familiar, John Bardeen, he also won the prize in 1956 for the invention of a little thing, I don't know, called the transistor, uh, which enables things like this to work. There's about 19 billion of them in here. I Googled that number just to see if I was right. Uh, it really is about 19 billion in a, in a modern iPhone. Uh, so transistors kind of worked out well for the guy, but you know, he was sort of like, I'm not done yet. And then he went on and did a lot of work in um, uh, superconductivity. And that's what this prize is for. They jointly discovered a theory of superconductivity, which conveniently was called the BCS theory for Bardeen, Cooper, and Schreifer. Um, now, the when some metals are really cooled, and I mean cooled way, way, way down, extremely low temperatures, they become what's known as superconductors. This basically just means they conduct electrical current without any resistance. There's there's no Borg in the way, nothing like that. It just goes down the wire with no resistance. Nothing heats up. And you had to use quantum mechanics to really describe this stuff. So the, the quantum mechanics when when wasn't really around when superconductors were first discovered. So they, they did this work in 1957. It did take a while for the prize to kind of uh, uh, come to be, but uh, the work was actually done in, in the late 50s. So these three guys, uh, superconductors, and let's dig a little bit more into that. Now, superconductors, a lot of people might just be like, oh, it's a superconductor and expect you to just go figure it out. So the way these things work and the reason they're important is what the rest of this video is going to be about. Now, when you get to these super low temperatures, the interaction between electrons and atoms in the metals uh, crystalline structure causes the electrons to just pair up. So you don't get sort of one electron at a time. They become pairs. And as a result, their movement becomes very orderly. So they kind of go exactly where you want to because at a room temperature or a higher temperature one, these things are nowhere near room temperature yet, but at a higher temperature metal, uh, the movement of electrons tends to be very random. And uh, in the process of the, them lining up and being orderly, poof, electrical resistance just disappears. It goes away like magic. Now, the phenomena was first discovered in 1911, uh, and there was actually a Nobel Prize awarded for it in 1913 by uh, Camerley. Uh, Ons, I think was his name, uh, won the prize that year, and it was impossible for them to really explain it at the time. It, re it required a quantum mechanical description. Quantum mechanics was, if it existed at all at that point, was in its infancy. So it did exist at some level, but it was still in its infancy at that point. Um, but you had to have quantum mechanics to really explain it. Now, great, now we have superconductors and what would they be used for? And by the way, we do have superconductors today. People are still working on them and they're trying to get them to higher and higher and higher temperatures because these things are really, really, really cooled. And it doesn't make a practical application in your house if you have to keep it well below liquid nitrogen temperatures. But let's dig into what they'd be used for if we could ever get one of these pesky little things at a room temperature. Now, I think Sometimes you hear these phrases like superconductor or other things, you may not understand just exactly how important these things are because the terms get thrown around a lot and sort of we, sometimes they show up in sci-fi and other things and we're like, okay, yeah, whatever. It's just a superconductor, no big deal. These things are so important to date. They have won five Nobel Prizes. So 1913 was the first one because they discovered them. Uh, 1972, which is the prize we're talking about again in 1973, 1987, and 2003. And remember, one of the people on this one won the prize twice, once for transistors and once for superconductors. So, you know, sort of a scientific powerhouse there. Um, he was not the first person to win two prizes. That was actually Marie Curie. She won one in physics and chemistry. But I think he was the first to win two in physics. Um, so, you know, hats off to him. Uh, applica the applications of this, some are current, some are not, but it, the current ones involve very high power MRIs because hospitals have the ability uh, to cool things down um, to, to super crazy low temperatures. But you can also, long term, there's there's applications like trains that can levitate on electromagnets, which you can do today. But if you could do it with zero resistance, you can use much less energy to cause the train to do that and move down the tracks with almost no um, resistance at all. So that would be a really interesting thing to do. You could essentially have um, very low cost um, uh, shipping and, and moving people around. It, it'd be fantastic. Um, now, 
highly efficient energy transmission. So think about it this way. Your power grid loses a lot of energy in the transmission, and that's because of resistance. The wires coming through to your house heat up. You run enough power through them, they get hot. It's just the way it works because of resistance. But if you had a resistance-free system, you could actually generate far less power at the power station and send things down the line without having to generate as much and pump it down that electrical pipe. Um, there's also applications in advanced nuclear fusion. I mean, if these things could work, they could actually pretty much, for lack of a better term, solve most of the, po the, the power industry problems and we could stop depending on either, largely depending on, on fossil fuels or, or other types of non-renewable energies. We could be down to pretty much renewables and superconductors. Uh, so they're, they're very interesting things to consider. They are getting better. They are getting higher temperature, although it's still not nearly room temperature. Maybe someday we'll have that breakthrough that gets to room temperature. That would be really cool uh, because they would just sort of change the world as we know it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to click like and subscribe. Uh, we'll see you in 1973, which again, we'll be talking about superconductors. So see you soon.